Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Liturgy of the Chalice. Today we continue our discussion to the Gospel of Mark with part 28 of a series. It seems that we will conclude the Gospel of Mark's Easter story on Easter itself, so that seems very auspicious. <laughs> we'll finish our discussion of the Gospel of Mark on Easter itself, and then the following Sunday we'll begin discussing the Gospel of, of Matthew from its beginning through to its end, for as long as that should take. <clears throat> Let's continue with where we left off last time. So now we find ourselves with Jesus and three of his disciples, according to the Gospel of Mark, in Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. So in Mark 14, 32 through 42, it says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See. My betrayer is at hand. So there are several important factors to take away from this reading of Mark 14, 32 through 42. The first part is that as you go through the canonical gospels, gospel of Mark was first historically, gospel of Matthew followed by Luke and John, the earliest Gospel of Mark makes Jesus very human in all of his teachings and interactions. And as you progress through Matthew, Luke, and finally John, you become, Jesus seems to become more divinized over time as the practice of Christianity after the crucifixion event developed, so did the ideas about Jesus develop. Of course, as we all know who regularly attend these church services, Jesus was a Jewish sage and he wouldn't have considered himself to be God. He just wouldn't have. And the Gospel of Mark seems to indicate that Jesus was a pre-existing being in the cosmos and that from him, his essential unity with God, and from him, Jesus, as God, emanated all beings, all things, and created all things. This doesn't seem to be what the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel, teaches. 
And here, we see Jesus having very human emotions. Here we see that Jesus was distressed and agitated, that he was deeply grieved. So Jesus was suffering. He knew what was going to happen to him. In our last talk, he had foreknowledge that one of his disciples would betray him. And he seemed to know after that event of the Last Supper, so to speak, we next see him in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying that this arrest, which would lead to torture and execution, would somehow bypass him. So Jesus was very upset. If you were God, you probably wouldn't be so upset or grieved because you knew you were the infinite. You knew that even if you lost your body, it wouldn't much matter, right? You'd just go back to being God in heaven. So this shows a very human part of Jesus. And it lets us be able to relate to him too. Because Jesus did suffer fear. He suffered anger. He suffered trauma. But yet he was able to spiritually overcome it in his resurrection event. Likewise, this lets us know that it's okay to go through difficult times. That when we're, we're, when we're distressed, when we're agitated, when we're grieving, that we're not somehow spiritually failing. But in fact, these dark moments in life are part of our evolution. They're part of our transformation, both before the time of death and continuing after the time of death with the phenomenon known as resurrection. In the epistles or the letters of Paul, Paul develops his Christology that we just need to believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus to be saved. We don't really need anything else. Faith or belief alone in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is enough. And it became difficult because Paul stated that Jesus was the Davidic Messiah, which Jesus himself I believe in Mark chapter 13, verse 28, somewhere around there. In that area, Jesus uh, said he didn't believe in a Messiah ben David. But yet Paul, who never met Jesus, never was taught by Jesus, he made that claim for Jesus. And it's one of the reasons why many Jews at that time could not accept Jesus as any kind of Messiah. Because there are many messianic expectations. Some Jews believed one kind of messianic expectation would come. Some believed multiple forms of Messiah would come to save Israel. And some believed that there was no Messiah at all. This is the history of it. It's the real facts. But the Jews at the time that believed and expected a Messiah ben David could not believe that Jesus was such, right? Because the Messiah ben David was victorious. He didn't die like Jesus died. He conquered the known world and sat on a throne and ruled Israel. He restored Israel both as a national entity and as a spiritual entity and basically all of the rule, all of the known world would come under the this Messiah Ben David's rule. And that didn't happen with Jesus. So most Jews, the very vast majority of Jews, did not accept Jesus as the Davidic Messiah because it wasn't logical. And in fact, as we've already stated many, many times, and we'll state over and over again, Jesus himself did not subscribe to the idea of a Messiah Ben David. So in order to make Jesus victorious, Paul developed the idea of the second coming of Jesus, that he would come again 
in this conflation of the prophecies of uh, Daniel, that he would come down and this would trigger a judgment day, a day of the Lord, not the same kind of day of Lord that Yahweh, that, uh, that uh, Isaiah predicted, the day of the Lord that Isaiah predicted and other earlier prophets predicted was a judgment of the Israel people, the people of Israel, by Yahweh, by Adonai, not by Jesus. But when Paul spoke about the day of the Lord, this judgment day, he was speaking of Jesus coming down as Lord Jesus Christ in the second coming, as Davidic Messiah. And he'd conquer the known world, make a new Jerusalem. All the good guys would go to heaven and all the bad guys would go you know where. That was Paul's theory. And in this Christological theory of Paul, Jesus became a willing blood atonement for a wrathful God to take away the sins of all people who would just believe in him, believe in his life, his death, and resurrection. Here we see that Jesus was not a willing blood atonement. He did not want to die. He did not want to be crucified. He was distressed. He was agitated. He was deeply grieved. He prayed at least twice, remove this cup from me, Father. Please remove this suffering from me. Free me of this trial that's coming. But not what I want. What you want, because you, God, knows what's best for me. So Jesus was not a willing blood atonement. <laughs> he didn't conceive of himself as such. He prayed to God like many of us pray when we're suffering, going through trauma, going through pain. We pray to God in a distressed and agitated state. Please, God, remove this situation from my life, this impending disaster. But what we don't pray, that we should pray, that Jesus is emulating for us. We should always pray to God sincerely with a full, loving, trusting heart. And at the end of our prayers, we should say, However, Abba, Father, Mother, God, not what I want, but what you want. Or as older versions of the Bible translate, not my will, but thy will be done. As in the Master's Prayer. So it's important to understand here that Jesus was very human. And he was also very divine. But in the same sense that each of us is divine, we are all divine children of the one Father, Mother, God, the Abba. And it is by doing the halakha of Jesus that we attain the Christhood of Jesus, the mastership of Jesus, the resurrected state of consciousness while still living in the body. Jesus was a full master. He could have given the world so much more, but he was taken too early. Next, we come into what develops in the rest of this talk. We have this idea that Jesus asked them to sit here while I pray. And then he tells him, he tells them to remain here, keep awake. Uh, he says, keep awake one, two, three, three times. And from a superficial look at the English translation, you'd think that he's just saying, keep your eyes open, stay awake, don't fall asleep. But when you roll back this word awake, back to its Hebrew or Aramaic term. 
The term is mishkad or shakad. And this means a vigil. And this term is known throughout Judaism to be a type of meditation. And in our tradition, my apostolic tradition that I come from, it is taught that this is a meditation on God's light. So he was asking them to keep awake, focusing on God's light. In this meditation on the white light of God, the white light of the Christ, within the upper half of the head, within the cranium, this is a high form of prayer because it becomes a communion with the light of God. And inherent in that love of God is life, love, wisdom, power, creation, and destruction. To meditate in that light is very transformative, and it can transform situations. It can change circumstances. So to be awake means to meditate. That is for sure. The rest is my conjecture, my intuition, based off of my personal experience with different forms of meditation and how they've changed difficult things for me into facilitated processes. I believe Jesus wanted all of them to pray and meditate together, that the trials that were to come for Jesus and the sufferings that came to almost all of the apostles who are execute, executed one by one for preaching the gospel, he wanted to pray to God and to focus on God to mitigate those negativities, to possibly eliminate them. But for whatever reason, the disciples could not stay awake and focus like Jesus focused. And I'm not saying the apostles were at fault for the crucifixion of Jesus or even their own ultimate executions in most cases. Mary Magdalene died of old age, uh, John the Beloved died of old age, but most of the others were executed according to ancient church traditions. So, I do believe that was one of Jesus' intents for praying, was to mitigate or to eliminate the impending disasters, the arrests, tortures, executions of himself and his disciples not only for their own personal relief, but so that the gospel can continue to be taught. Because if everybody was arrested, they would have all been murdered. They would have all been tortured and murdered as traitors to the Roman government. I do believe that many people in the gospel called Jesus son of David because they thought or believed he was the Messiah of David despite his teachings. And when you have crowds of people saying, he's the Messiah ben David, he's the Messiah ben David, the Jewish people took advantage of that. Number one, they said, he is not our Messiah. He's not teaching the way we teach. He can't be the Messiah. And then they started whispering into Pilate's ears and the Roman governance's ears, be careful of this man. He believes he's the Messiah and David. He believes he's king. We have no king or ruler other than Caesar. So it was the Jewish high priesthood and the Roman governance that killed Jesus. Not all Jews, as has historically been taught by the Roman Catholic Church and essentially all Protestant churches, up to and including the present day. I think some of those sects are beginning to change their tune due to modern sensibilities. 
But that was what keep awake means. Keep awake was not simply keeping your eyes awake. It meant to meditate. It means specifically to keep a vigil. To keep a vigil on God's light, which is to meditate. And of course, if any of you have tried to meditate, your minds start to wander. And when your minds wander away from the white light in shikad meditation, then you can pray intensely to God with words, with thoughts, with emotion. And then return your mind back to the one-pointed concentration on the white light within the brain, within the upper half of the head of the cranium. But finally, Jesus saw that uh, the prayers were not working in the way that I suggested. And he said, enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man, Jesus as an individual Son of Man Messiah, part of the collective Son of Mankind Messiah. This Son of Man, myself, Jesus, will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And they see Judas approaching with a mob. So in Mark 14, 43 through 52, it says, Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him, there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. So here is the popular scene of Judas identifying Jesus with a kiss. Jesus was a, a celebrity in Jerusalem. Trust me, all the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, the vast majority of them, if not all of them, knew who Jesus was just to see him. The identification of kissing Jesus on the cheek was so that the Roman authorities would know who Jesus was, because they didn't know who Jesus was. He was just another Jim Bob Joe <laughs> from this, uh, you know, low-class people of Israelites, right? So Judas kissed Jesus so the Romans would know who to arrest. And there was a scuffle. One of Jesus' disciples cut off the ear of a slave of a high priest. Notice it's notable that in this rendition of the story, Jesus did not heal the, heal the ear of that slave. Here, Jesus just witnesses the ear being cut off. And Jesus is indignant here. He's not fearful anymore. He's powerful. And he says, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Are you for real? You cowards! Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. Why do you think that they didn't arrest him in the daytime in public? Because Jesus had many followers, multitudes, thousands and thousands. And the high priests wanted Jesus arrested at night 
invisible to the public so that there wouldn't be an uprising, so there wouldn't be a rebellion to free Jesus. They wanted to arrest Jesus in secret, try him in secret, torture him in secret, and have him executed well before Passover occurred, so that there wouldn't be any uprising. And then it's quoted here in bold, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. In other words, the ideas are, let me be arrested, let me be tortured, and let me be crucified to fulfill the scriptures, to fulfill what was said in the Hebrew Testament about my coming. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, in the New Testament, when Jesus or anybody else quotes the Hebrew Testament, they are trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, or that Jesus is something special and that he was foretold by the prophets as of old. We will discuss what the writers of the gospel were trying to prove here with let the scriptures be fulfilled. Essentially, there's a psalm that describes great suffering and breaking of bones, etc. And we'll discuss it next week in great depth. But essentially, they're putting these words into Jesus' mouth, saying, let the scriptures be fulfilled. Let me be arrested. Let me be tortured. Let my bones be broken to fulfill what is written in psalms. We'll discuss this next week. But let it suffice to say that this is not historical. Jesus would not have said this. I do believe Jesus said of you come with swords and clubs. Are you guys too cowardly to arrest me in the daylight when others would speak up for me in my spiritual authenticity? He would have said that. But cherry-picked phrases from the Hebrew Testament, they're not historical. They are trying to be, make Jesus something out to be he wasn't. Or to create a storyline, as we'll see next week, that we couldn't possibly know. All of them deserted him and fled. So here it makes, again, all the disciples, all the apostles seem like utter cowards. But the fact is, we discussed it last week, and this is part of my apostolic tradition, that Jesus would have told all of them to run away. Why? If they were all arrested and murdered, we wouldn't have any form of Christianity or Jesus' teachings because they all would have died. And with it, Jesus' Holocaust teachings would have died. No matter how they were framed, by which Christian sect. So Jesus wanted them all to run away. And apparently, the guards, the Romans, or the people with the chiefs, the chief priests, scribes, and elders, apparently they tried to catch some of the apostles because one of them, a certain young man, was following him, Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. And they, one of the members of the mob, caught hold of him. But he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. So they tried to catch this boy that was wearing just a linen cloth over his skin, very lightly clad, and they grabbed onto his linen, but the boy kept on running off into the woods, or into nature, or away from the scene, whatever it was, and the person trying to arrest him was just left with the linen cloth in his hand as the young man ran away naked. Again, it is our apostolic tradition that says they did not run away due to cowardice. They ran away because they were instructed to run away. If all of them were arrested, tortured, or murdered, Jesus would have died for nothing. Jesus died for truth. Jesus died to teach us. Jesus died to give us spiritual practices that we are to embody in our mind, in our hearts, in our actions in every word that we speak. 
And if all of Jesus' disciples would have died with him, his death would have been a true waste because his teachings would have been erased from history. We have this interesting thing called Secret Mark, which teaches about final initiation into the mysteries of heaven, the Ratzim of heaven. And in this book of Secret Mark, it exerts that there were two Gospels written by Mark, the one we all know and one we don't know. And church authorities would be likely to say, oh, this is just made up nowadays. We can't believe this. But the fact is, is that these are excerpts in the screen from a letter of Clement of Alexandria on Secret Mark. Clement of Alexandria was the successor of Peter. He was a bishop of Alexandria. So, this has been proven to be a historical letter. It's very interesting, and I only give parts of it to you. So look up Secret Mark online, or go to earlychristianwritings.com, which is a great resource, earlychristianwritings.com, and look for Secret Mark to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a certain part of it here. So in the letter, Clement uh, is it's the context that somebody has acquired a version of the Gospel of Secret Mark from the Capocratians, which is a Gnostic sect of Christians run by a man called Carpocrates, I believe is how you pronounce his name. And according to Clement, Carpocrates had uh, bastardized this holy sacred book, the secret, book, the secret Gospel of Mark in that he had twisted it to be some kind of homosexual initiation. And again, it's not that homosexuality is wrong. It's absolutely natural and normal for all ages. It was just ostracized by some small-minded humans all around the world and all religions. But let's not get into that. The idea of why it's bastardized, whatever Clement's emotions may have been behind that, is because the initiation wasn't sexual in nature at all. We'll discuss what that may have been in a moment and how we know a little bit about that from other scriptures available to us. So here Clement is telling this man that has brought him this forged or redacted version of the authentic secret mark that Carpocrates allegedly was teaching his Gnostic sect. So, here is what Clement writes. As for Mark, then, during Peter's stay in Rome, he wrote an account of the Lord's doings, not, however, declaring all of them, nor yet hinting at the secret ones, but selecting what he thought most useful for increasing the faith of those who are being instructed. But when Peter died a martyr, Mark came over to Alexandria, bringing both his own notes and those of Peter, from which he transferred to his former book the things suitable to whatever makes for progress toward knowledge. Thus he composed a more spiritual gospel, the secret gospel of Mark, for the, for the use of those who are being perfected, Nevertheless, he yet did not divulge the things not to be uttered, nor did he write down the hierophantic teaching of the Lord, but to the stories already written he added yet others, and moreover brought in certain sayings of which he knew the interpretation would, as a mystagogue, lead the hearers into the innermost sanctuary of that truth, hidden by seven veils. Thus in some, he prepared matters, neither grudgingly nor incautiously, in my opinion. In dying, he left his composition to the church. In one verso Alexandria, where it even yet is most carefully guarded, 
being read only to those who are being initiated into the great mysteries. So here we see two tiers of teaching in the early Christian church. One that was for the masses, and one that were very serious about becoming perfected. Perfection means to be spiritually reborn into the collective Son of Mankind Messiah. The mysteries of the Ratzim of Heaven, the mysteries of the Kingdom of Heaven, the mysteries of the sovereignty of God, these things were taught separately. Which makes sense, because also in the Gospel we may remember that Jesus said, you know, to the masses I speak in parables, to you I teach openly. Meaning that there are some teachings for the, for the masses that might not be so serious or dedicated to spiritual practices. And there is a different extra set of teachings that were secret or withheld until a disciple would show his or her dedication to the path. In seriousness about doing the, the inner spiritual teachings, the inner halakha of Mar Yeshua. And then later on in the same letter, Clement uh, dictates part of what is in this secret book of Mark here in the italics. And they come into Bethany, and a certain woman whose brother had died was there. And coming, she prostrated herself before Jesus and says to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. But the disciples rebuked her. And Jesus, being angered, went off with her into the garden where the tomb was, and straightway a great cry was heard from the tomb. And going near, Jesus rolled away the stone from the door of the tomb. And straightway, going in where the, where the youth was, he stretched forth his hand and raised him, seizing his hand. But the youth, looking upon him, loved him, and began to beseech him that he might be with him. And going out of the tomb, they came into the house of the youth, for he was rich. And after six days, Jesus told him what to do. And in the evening, the youth comes to him wearing a linen cloth over his naked body. Sound familiar? A young man with a linen cloth over his body was almost captured, but was able to run away leaving the white linen in the hands of the arrester, right? And he remained with him that night, for Jesus taught him the mystery of the kingdom of God. And thence, arising, he returned to the other side of the Jordan. After these words follows the text, and James and John come to him, and all that section. But naked man with naked man, and the other things about which you wrote are not found. And after the words, and he comes into Jericho, the secret gospel adds only, and the sister of the youth whom Jesus loved, and his mother and Shalome were there, and Jesus did not receive them. But the many other things about which you wrote both seem to be and are falsifications. So here somebody is writing to Clement saying, look what I found. This is nasty. It's, it's insinuating that the initiations of our Lord were sexual acts. Whether straight acts or homosexual acts, it did not matter. It was debasing Holy Scripture by saying that it was a sexual nature initiation. That Jesus was having homosexual sex with people to initiate them. Which is total nonsense. So apparently this and other falsifications were in there that Carpocrates allegedly used to control his sects, which used, historically, homosexual initiations, sexualizing very spiritual initiations. So what is interesting is that, again, you can read the whole thing for yourself. But Secret Mark speaks about the fact that there are other teachings that Jesus gave to his disciples to perfect them. And the church keeps this away from many sincere seekers because they probably still have it in a vault somewhere in the freaking Vatican. Doesn't 
Doesn't it remind you of the Gospel of Matthew, how Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for not knowing the keys to the kingdom of heaven and keeping those keys away from others? Not understanding the keys to heaven and keeping those keys away from others. That's exactly what the Vatican is doing if secret mark is just sitting in their vaults. Luckily, we have a copy of it that is historical, dating back to historical times. And here we see that this youth, who, is, who does this youth sound like? A certain woman whose brother had died. Jesus goes into the tomb and the dead guy comes to life. We're speaking about Lazarus, right? That's who we're talking about. And when Jesus was purported, when Lazarus was risen from the dead, he asked to follow Jesus, to become an intimate disciple of Jesus. And then Jesus said, after six days, Jesus told him what to do. In the evening, the youth comes to him wearing a linen cloth over his body. And then in the evening time at night, Jesus would teach him the mystery of the kingdom of God. So this special initiation would be done at night. Jesus would give special preparatory information for the disciple to prepare to receive the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. In our apostolic tradition, it is taught that this means that Jesus gave them some kind of divine ascent, similar to the Jewish Merkaba ascent to the heavens, to the throne of God. When you read the Gospel of Mary, of Mary Magdalene, uh, she tells a story of how the living Jesus guided her in a divine ascent. This is something like what our apostolic tradition teaches about this situation in the secret book of Mark. That at night, there would be a one-on-one -on -one initiation with Jesus, and a prepared disciple, whether male or female, and they come covered in a white linen cloth, and Jesus would guide them into a state of ecstasy in a divine ascent to the heavens. And if they made it all the way to the throne of God, they would become perfected. What's really interesting to me, going back one slide to conclude our talk, is that, going back two slides, pardon me, Jesus tells them on this night to keep awake. And one of the people that is in Jesus' entourage that night was wearing a linen cloth covering a naked body. Meaning on that last night, when Jesus knew he'd be arrested, he was, just, he was still trying to initiate one disciple into the mysteries of heaven. They were all meditating together in praying to God, not only to remove the impending trial of Jesus and the apostles, as we already talked about, but possibly they were meditating in the vicinity of the area where Jesus was uh, initiating this young man who was wearing nothing but a linen cloth at night in a private garden where Jesus could initiate him into the mysteries. So that would have been the last person, whoever it was, that Jesus himself initiated into the mysteries. Let us continue with the Liturgy of the Chalice.